representative, went to Texas A&M University, so he's a proud Aggie like myself. I have to throw that in there a few times. Um, we have worked together over the years on this hemp issue, so we call him our hemp hero. So it's pretty exciting to have him here today. He was the author of HB 1325, which was the bill that made it legal to grow hemp in the state of Texas. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> legislation here in the room with us that you're going to be able to hear from first and foremost and be able to ask questions to. So uh, we've been working together on this issue since 2015 when I was just a staffer in the building um, from the Department of Agriculture and then also now uh, representing a coalition. So uh, we'll get into some questions but first of all I just want to hand it over to uh, the chairman and then let him maybe start off on maybe what he feels like uh, the hemp industry and why you wanted to get involved. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me, and I appreciate all of you being here today. I, uh, as she mentioned, I was chair of the House Agriculture and Livestock Committee, and I grew up in a farming and ranching community, so I've, I've always been painfully aware of how difficult that is, the difficult way of life that can be, or it's a great way of life to work. My father used to say it was, a, it was the best way of life and the worst way to make a living that there was, and um, it was farming and ranching. But uh, I guess it was around 2013 or 2011, people started talking about legalizing hemp and I was chairman of the House Ag and Livestock Committee and they came through our committee, of course, and uh, several different people carried different versions of the bill. And uh, there were some folks that I see Coleman Hemp Hills here and he was involved in the very genesis of this thing. And um, so, um, and it came, you know, to those of you, probably most of you know, it's got to go, bill's got to get passed out of committee and then go to the, another committee and then get scheduled for a vote on the House floor. It's a long process by, by design. And so the first few versions of the bill that came up were fine as far as I was concerned, but I knew that there was a lot of concern about him uh, amongst the leadership in the House and the Senate. And so uh, we wouldn't have been able to get the bill out of the calendars committee. Um, maybe didn't have votes to get it out of the Ag Committee for the author of the bill. I, I don't remember all the authors, but I know Doc Anderson carried it one time from Waco, and I think Bill Zedler from Fort Worth carried a version of it one time, I think. And uh, anyway, so there were three sessions when they kind of tinkered around with the hemp bill, and but we didn't have the support to get it out of the House. And then um, by then I had moved on out of the Ag Committee and I was on a different committee, but um, I thought the time was ripe, so to speak, and so, I filed the hemp bill in uh, 2019, and we had uh, the right coalition of people in the leadership and everything where I thought we could get it passed, and we, we managed to pass the bill. As you know, House Bill 1325, Charles Perry carried it in the Senate, and uh, it worked out, and we got it passed, and the Lieutenant Governor uh, signed the bill. I did go meet with the Lieutenant Governor personally before that because he has uh, very serious concerns about anything that that uh, looks like marijuana legalization, and that's a, a very, very important issue to him. And that was always a sense, you know, at first you had to educate everybody what is hemp, how is industrial hemp different than marijuana, and those types of things in order to get it out. And so we ended up being able to pass it fairly much. I don't think it was hardly any no votes. It was pretty unanimous, yeah. the first set in 2019 yeah. session. And I spoke at one of these conferences right after that, and everybody was happy to build a pass. Of course, in the question and answer session, the questions were always the same, Melissa, as is, uh, you know, why didn't you do it this way or this way or this way? Why didn't y'all make this a little easier and that a little tougher and all that kind of thing? And I always tell people that passing a piece of legislation is, uh, I call it the art of the possible and not the perfect. And uh, you try to do what you can to get a bill passed. And we passed a bill out of the House of Representatives that was uh, basically mirrored the federal guidelines, which has always been my goal, to mirror the federal guidelines so that we could compete properly with any other state. Uh, in the Senate, there were some folks with some different opinions, and so the original bill had some limitations in it that if I'd had my way, I wouldn't have had in there. But I either had to accept those changes and uh, or um, basically uh, let the bill die, and I, I wasn't willing to do that. And so we, we accepted those changes in 2019 and uh, passed the bill that, that we have in place today, and the Department of Agriculture continues to work on rules for it, that type of thing. So that's kind of how we got started, that was my involvement in it. 
Yeah, and, and like he said, you know, we really had to compromise a lot when the bill was taken over to the Senate, and I know a lot of you are concerned about the smokable hemp ban, and, and that was one of our compromises that we had to make, is to ultimately get the bill passed to where all of our farmers are able to grow uh, Texas-grown hemp to where we can have it on the shelves in all the retail stores. We said, you know what, if that's the compromise that we have to make, that's the compromise that we have to make, and we'll work on that in the future, but, you know, Chairman King was responsible for really pushing it through and he's been an advocate from the very beginning. So he truly has been there for us as well as the countless other individuals who have been at the Capitol who have been advocating. So tell us about um, a little bit about this past session. You know, we worked on the bill together with a lot of other organizations as well that are in the room. Um, tell us about some of the trials and tribulations that we had this past session and kind of how we worked through that to get to ultimately what happened. Well, and you bring up the smokable hemp, and that was a classic case of, of um, you know, they, the leadership in the Senate had to draw a line some, so, somewhere, and so they drew it as smokable hemp. And I explained to them, you know, it's the same, and they said, yeah, but it, it looks and smells like marijuana when you burn it. And they said, well, okay. <laughs> all right, you know, whatever. And that's, 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 I said, fine. You know, well, I didn't say fine, I didn't have a choice. And, uh, and I know there was some people that had uh, had a lot of it in stock and everything. We've even tried to pass some legislation to where they could at least sell what they already had in stock somehow. So that was one of the frustrating things, but that's just an example. When, I mean, everybody, the legislature, is a bunch of humans in there. And so they, they come up with their own ideas and reasons that they do things. And so we fast forward to 2021, this last legislative session, uh, clearly after because it's a brand new program, you're going to, as the rules are evolved by the Texas Department of Agriculture and the Department of State Health Services, there are going to be things that you realize probably you need to try to do differently. And we knew that going into it. So there was some, uh, we introduced, uh, let me see, I don't remember the Senate bill number, but uh, Charles Perry filed a bill in the Senate and I wanted to be a part of the discussion. So I filed the identical bill in the House and uh, I was told that the bill was simply some things to make the farming part of it easier and that type of thing and to give a little bit more time for the inspections to be done and several other things to make it a little bit easier on the folks that were growing and harvesting and processing and selling hemp. And candidly, after I got the bill filed, uh, it wasn't too long before some people came to me and said, hey, uh, you know, we like a lot of this bill, but it's got this isomer deal in there. You know what that is? And I said, I what that is, you know, I just, I was told the bill was, just made some tweaks to it, to it. and they said, no, nah. they said, and that's when I learned what Delta 8 was, and uh, I've never heard of it, of course, and, at that time, and, um, and so they said, well, this is right, wrong, or indifferent, this is a big part of the hemp business right now, in one way or the other, and uh, they use it, you know, for different reasons, to get them into the store, and all that kind of stuff, and I said, well, okay, that wasn't, that wasn't my intention was to file, I wasn't trying to stop anything, I was just trying to foster what we were already doing. And so um, then I learned that that, uh, that provision was, was not a mistake in that bill, that there was somebody in the Senate leadership that felt very, very strongly about that. And so um, we visited back and forth a number of times over the session and, and I, I took that provision and some other stuff out of the bill and I sent it back to the Senate. And ultimately, uh, the Senator did not want to concur uh, with those changes and so, we didn't pass the bill. So my hope is, is that next time we can work on it again, or that the Texas Department of Agriculture, perhaps through the rulemaking process, uh, it's interesting, you know, normally we don't want agencies to make a lot of rules. We want to tell them what rules they need to make, but occasionally they need them to make some rules. And so I'm hoping that they'll do some rules to implement some of the parts of that piece of legislation that everybody agreed on. And, and I think that they will. We've had some conversations from the coalition's uh, point of view with the Department of Ag, you know, asking, you know, can we give recommendations on what we want in rulemaking? And they have made it very clear to us that they would like to follow all of the new federal final rules that have come down from USDA, that they would like to implement those, and that we're gonna go through the piece of legislation that Tracy King, uh, Representative King authored, and then take the pieces from that legislation that we really liked, which is the majority of the bill, and make sure that that is implemented into the rules at the Department of Agriculture. Um, for Department of State and Health Services, it's a little bit of a different structure to that. I have had discussions with them. Um, at the moment, they don't plan on moving any further with, you know, banning anything else that is hemp-derived in 
product lineups that are sold at retail stores, which is a good thing. Uh, but you know, they are having some meetings with their higher ups to see how do we move forward on this because they're going to continue to get questions and it might be some pressure that they get from other people in the legislature that ask them to do certain things. So, you know, rulemaking, like you said, usually we don't want that to happen and that's why we have legislation and we put things in statute. But our Department of Agriculture under Commissioner Sid Miller, they have been wonderful and they really do implement a lot of the rules for us so that necessarily because it's a federal program, the rules tend to change and will be forever changing. And so it's a little better for this industry and it just to go in and change the rules instead of having to put it into statute to wait another two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what issues do you see arising in future sessions that we can work on to help support the hemp industry? Has anybody been talking to you lately? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, interestingly enough, an article popped up on my, on my phone you know, something pops up because you clicked on something one time six months ago, so they think you're interested, I guess. And um, it was an article about the hemp industry in general, all over the United States, and the situation that a lot of the growers are in financially. And, um, and, and you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that. But uh, I, I mean, candidly, that the Delta Eight issue is not going to go away, particularly in Texas. And uh, there's a number of states that have done and passed rules to. Uh, limit or outlaw the use of Delta-8, and there's other isomers that are, I believe that's the right word, isn't it, uh, that, are, are, that are coming up right behind that, that somebody's gonna come up with. So that's an issue that that sooner or later you're gonna have to deal with. And the federal government may do it for us, and if the feds do it, well then, then that that's what we'll do. And that's, like I said again, my goal was always to try to keep our, our statute in line with the fed statute so that we had the maximum opportunities to compete with everybody around the United States. And so that, that issue is not going to go away. That's going to be back next time um, in some form or fashion, and either by the federal government or the state government. Um, and then, um, then the rest of it is just farming. I mean, that's what I've told. I told this group, when I was, or a group like this, the last one I spoke to up here, you know, it's farming. And it, it's, you got to be careful who you associate with. And, and everything. I know there's a banking issue that's come up. A friend of mine, or an acquaintance of mine, Coleman introduced me back to me too, was telling me that he was having trouble getting any banking loans. And I talked to several bankers, and and it's the same thing that the marijuana growers have to deal with in, in the marijuana states is that you know, the federal FDIC rules don't specifically say they can't lend anything that has to do with cannabis and hemp, but but it, it's the, the belief of the bankers. And I talked to several large ag bankers in my part of the world that do a lot of agricultural lending and they said that they just they just won't they won't make the loan. In fact, one of them told me that uh, they're not even in, in their policy and they said they do it anyway, but uh, they can't even accept a banking account or a checking account and set up an account for a convenience store that sells C B D products. And so technically I mean that, that's what they say. So because of the of the whole federal banking issue. So so that's something that's going to be coming up, but I have no doubt that that uh, I know that the marijuana industry and the, and the states that where it is, they're, they've been working on something to help them with that, and that by, by default, I think that'll help those of us in the hemp business. Yes, and then another issue to bring up, and it was unfortunate that we weren't able to push some of those things through, <coughs> were, were about you know hemp being used for animal feed um, for human consumption. Can you speak to that, and then maybe you know how we can work on that in the future? to make sure that that does pass through and then our state is able to do something? Well, I think that's a, a great opportunity uh, for, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the whitetail deer business, for example, but in Texas, whitetail deer are, are it's a big deal. And in South Texas, uh, it's a, they, a lot of people put out supplemental feed, protein um, for those deer because it helps them grow larger antlers. And so um, there's a big movement, I think, to sell a hemp or add hemp products to animal feed for not only for the ones that are consumed by humans, which of course you can't do that right now because of regulatory issues, but that's something that we need to be doing. But like white-tailed deer and those types of feeding it to wildlife and things like that, I think is a big market that is uh, can be tapped. And we definitely agree, and we think that it's something of the future. It's unfortunate that it's a it's a federal program, and federally it's not legal to you know feed it to animals for human consumption um, it was in hb 1325 the original bill that tracy king passed 
Um, it's just that because it's not a federal program, our, uh, the agency that's over that program wasn't willing to write new rules or do anything or move forward with it. So I think that as we move forward, that's something that we can work on because we are in an agriculture state. We are very high up in the beef industry as well. A lot of feedlots are wanting to, you know, grow it there and then you know feed it to their animals as a supplement as well and i think that as the state of texas as an agriculture industry that we all kind of have to band together and work on it and maybe in the future we can have a piece of legislation that's separate from any bill so that we can ensure that something like that goes through and what happened this session doesn't happen again it's just it was one of those things to where we loved everything that was in the bill we knew that the only thing that we had to save in there was really we needed that uh 20 to 30 days, which, you know, I'd love for you to touch on that as well. I think that's something that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, Chairman King had an amendment for us. Um, if you'd like to touch on that with them, I think they'd love to hear it. Yeah, so the one of the things that was in House Bill 3948 was extended the amount of time that a license holder has before harvesting a crop from 20 to 30 days after the pre-harvest samples are taken. And that matches with the USDA rules. And and so uh, that simply allows people a little bit more time to uh, do their testing on their crop, make sure they to try not to get a hot crop. And so uh, that was part of 3948, and that was something that, that had widespread acceptance and everybody wanted it. And I was able to get that on the, uh, on the sunset bill for the, um, which one was it? The, the Department of Agriculture. Yeah, the Department of Agriculture. So the, the author of that bill, uh, Chairman Terry Canales, offered to let me put that on there. So I did put uh, that provision as an amendment to the agriculture bill. So that did get into the law. And then there's a few other things that I'm hoping that the department will be able to draft some rules. But you know, I still I still continue to maintain that the, the long-term future of the hemp industry, I think, is the industrial hemp portion of it, is the growing and the processing of it and the manufacturing of those types of things. The CBD oil, is where the hype is and where the money was and still can be, but um, long term, at least for the state of Texas, and uh, I, I still maintain that the future for it is gonna be the people that are managed to be around uh, whenever the processing plants get cranked up and those types of things. I think that's gonna be the long term future. Are you seeing more legislators maybe that are a little more open-minded to the hemp industry and let's say cannabis industry in the future? Well, there's going to be certainly the hemp industry because what happens is, you know, the legislature, the people that serve in the legislature are a reflection of the people that live in their district and that vote in their primaries and their elections, their ele primary elections and their general elections. And people can say what they want about you, you forget where you serve from and everything, but I promise you, if you get a bunch of people from home coming to you and talking to you about an issue, um, it becomes important to you. And that's just the way it works. And if it doesn't become important to you, you generally lose the opportunity to serve because they find somebody that it is important to. And so I have heard a lot more about him and CBD and uh, Delta A and all that kind of stuff in the last few years uh, because people like you are talking to the legislators and wherever they live about those particular issues. And that's very, very important for you to do that. And uh, and the whole issue of marijuana legalization in Texas, you know, they, they had a bill this time to up the limits from uh, for the compassionate use marijuana, that's the, for medical purposes, medicinal purposes. And they wanted to up the use, the, the concentration of that from 0.5% THC to 5% THC, which is still a long way from recreational marijuana. But, um, I mean, they could get that done. And so, and they had some other things. They did expand the universe of people that were eligible for it. So, and of course I supported that legislation also. But that all goes to say that, um, that marijuana legalization is still a few years away in the state of Texas, in my opinion. I mean, you just, the leadership in the state is just very, very cautious about those types of things. And so that's just, you know, that's what I see. And we don't have an issue for referendum in Texas, um, which, is a good thing. Initiative and referendum is where the people can actually pass petitions around and you get so many signatures and then it requires the legislature to put something on the ballot to be voted on as a constitutional amendment. And a lot of states don't have that. We don't have it here. And it, it, some places in California has it, for example. But 
and it's a good thing and a bad thing. It depends on which side of the issue you're on, you know. And so, uh, whatever the issue might be, it, it came about because of initiative and referendums. They would call it INR. So, but as I said before, if enough people talk to enough legislators, then that is the initiative, and it does become a referendum, and it becomes a piece of legislation that, that grows and gathers support. And uh, it's a long process. You know, it's hard to believe we spent six to eight years getting hemp legal in the state of Texas. And so, uh, but we're a ways away on marijuana, I think. I, I would have to agree. You know, as we sit here on the stage and we look out in the crowd and we see people that we've worked on this issue with from the beginning, it's kind of cool to see where we are now. But when we get asked about cannabis all the time, it's just because of the lay of the land, because the leadership, especially you know, our Lieutenant Governor, who, as we've seen this past session, pushed back on a lot of issues. You know, our piece of legislation wasn't the only piece of legislation that had a ban on Delta 8 in it. You know, they put it in some of the cannabis bills that were out of Representative Joe Moody carried. So, you know, it was unfortunate it was the decriminalization bill, and it's unfortunate that that got caught up into it, and then ultimately, you know, died on the Senate floor uh, because that was pretty bipartisan and was supported. It's just when it got to the conference committee, they just didn't concur. So hopefully in the future, if we maybe get new leadership or somebody changes their mind, I don't know, uh, we'll be able to move forward, but I think we're still gonna have to fight. Yeah, the decriminalization bill uh, to lessen the penalties basically didn't right. criminalize it, but it uh, made it less criminal. Um, <laughs> was, uh, was a good piece of legislation and had a, a lot of support 10 years ago, that bill wouldn't have had a chance not even a chance in the Texas House of Representatives, and it passed this time pretty easily. But, uh, and I don't fault anybody. I mean, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, and, and uh, Lieutenant Governor's a friend of mine, and I have a great deal of respect for him. We just, you know, respectfully disagree on this particular topic, and so um, that's the way it is. And, and, you know, we say that, I mean, I don't mean to start a panic here, but as far as I know, there's not a ban on Delta 8 anywhere out there, but they might have got one in there that, I, that got by us, you know, I'm, that got by the people that were watching it. So, I mean, you never say never in the legislative process, because there was, you know, there was, oh, six or 7,000 bills introduced, and usually about 12 or 1,300 of them managed to become law, and there's probably a couple of dozen of them that this would be germane or relevant to. So, I mean, bills become effective uh, September 1, generally speaking, unless they have immediate effect provisions. And so, you know, after September, we may get a surprise, but I don't, I don't think so. And I, I, don't, Let's, I, don't, I think we're good. Yeah, but I, I mean, I didn't make it my business to watch all of that. that was, other people were watching that, but I just, I'm just being realistic here, so. No, and I think that's good for everyone to hear. Uh, well, we will take some, oh, and another question is, are you running for re-election? I plan to, yes, okay. ma'am, thank you. Well, that's good to hear. We have to remember this campaign season, you know, who we support and who supports all of our efforts. So when you're thinking of donating, <coughs> gentleman to my left is definitely someone that should be donated to, that's for sure. And we will be having a fundraiser in the future for him as well because he saved basically the industry in Texas and that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> And he's very well respected, so when he carries a piece of legislation, people listen. So that's always helpful. Um, but we will take some questions right now. Uh, if you have a question, just please raise your hand and we'll get a mic over to you. We ask that you just speak clearly and say, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jared. I'm actually with Texas Cannabis TV. And uh, quick question. So. It seems to be that <clears throat> legislation attempts with legalizing has actually progressed fairly reasonably from last session from last session uh, to this session in some regards. But it seems like there's a few people in the legislature that, legislature that don't actually fit the um, I guess the pulse of Texas right now. Like we want this to be legalized. And in particular, Dan Patrick, as Lieutenant Governor, who doesn't seem to have any um, resistance in legislation, like anybody that can challenge him, but he seems to be a really big um, culprit, I guess you could say, to the legalization process. What do you feel like, even if the legislation ha 
had support, he ultimately would be the figure that would be the last straw. Would he even consider legislation? Or would do you think he would need to be someone that would probably be replaced in order to get this even? Well, I mean, right people track. can file legislation, and there's always some, some kind of decriminalization legislation filed, legalization. There has been for years and years and years. And, um, and, and like I said, everybody has a right to their opinion. Um, I think that each person believes that they're representing their constituency. And we may disagree on, you know, my perception of what the mood or the sentiment of the people are may be one thing, and yours may be something different. We're all entitled to that, so I don't fault anybody for uh, exercising whatever authority they have, uh, given their position that they have. So uh, that's just, uh, I'm not trying to talk around it. I'm just saying, that, you know, they have, that's what you, if you're the governor or the lieutenant governor or the attorney general or state rep or state senator, or you have an ability to influence something like that. Well, and you have themes about it, about what's good for the state of Texas or not good for the state of Texas, and you certainly should exercise those. But at some point, if, uh, uh, if the legalization movement across the United States continues to, to grow as it has, well, then I, I have no doubt that someday Texas will. But uh, I don't think it's going to be next year. So, <laughs> and I did read, I, I think I have read that in some of the states where they have adopted recreational marijuana, they're now talking about uh, putting limits on the amount of THC that they can have in it and some things like that. So. I mean, it's, a, it's an evolving, evolving beast. Um, here, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Marla. Um, my question is, um, all the talk about legislation and <coughs> marijuana, et cetera, the, is Texas or any of our lawmakers, representatives, taking into any account and using any of the other states that have it legalized as any kind of model to bring to our lawmakers to say, hey, you know, this is working for them, this isn't, and so maybe we could, you know, use this as our platform to jump off from to not entice, but I'm like, you know, a little lost for words in here with this, and to go to a, the next step of legalizing it. Because, you know, we're doing, we're just doing the hemp for fiber, et cetera. But we're doing that to get our foot in the door because, as like you said, it's, it's possible in the future and the thing is. The answer to the question is yes. I mean, people look for what's working in other states and what's not working as a possible model whenever they're, whenever they're considering legislation. They sure do. Yeah, and then even when we were working on 1325 from 2019, uh, we were in a lot of talks with Kentucky, Oklahoma as a bordering state to see how their program is run. So a lot of our legislation is reflected in those states. And obviously, we worked with USDA and what you know with US and Brown Table and the federal bill that they had, the Shell bill that came down. So yes, we're always talking with other states and we're seeing what they're doing. That's a lot of what we do with the coalition. Is I've got. Other groups in other states that I work with, um, I worked with Colorado a lot this past legislative session, um, Tennessee, a lot of the other groups that are maybe a little more similar to Texas, and it's like, how did you guys battle this? We're, we're going through the same thing right now. So yes, we're all doing that all the time because we want to make sure that what works in a state may work for us, what doesn't work, we don't want to bring that into Texas. Yeah. And I think that that kind of goes forward into the future when you're thinking of cannabis. And that, that uh, Liz brings up a good point. I mean, we do that on any, any topic, whatever it might be. We always look around and see what other people are doing also. Mm -hmm. So 